morning, friends. We got one week before Christmas Eve, which will be fun. And then we're going to finish the book of Revelation on December 31st in two weeks. We are in chapter 21 today, and we'll conclude in chapter 22 in a couple weeks. And so if you've got your Bibles, let's go to chapter 22, or sorry, chapter 21, the last page in your Bible. The Bible is 66 different books written by more than 40 authors in more than three languages, talking about one unified story. And we concluded last week looking at Jesus Christ's return, setting up what was seen as a millennial kingdom. I misspoke about one person last week. My friend Julie let me know that Vody Bauckham is actually in an Amil camp, not a premillennial camp, for those who can recall last week and would like to properly place him. But here we're on this last page of the Bible. And I could go just verse by verse and try to pull it apart for 35 minutes, but I think we should first go to the very first page of the Bible and see if we can sew this story up together. For our greatest hope is not that we go to him, but that he comes to us again. Our greatest hope, which is going to be very surprising, that on the last page of the Bible, it's not a description of a heaven scene, but what comes out of heaven to restore the earth. So keep your finger on the last page of the Bible, and we're going to go to the very first page of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. And you're going to have to hold some things in your mind today for about 25 minutes. Are you game for that? I, I hope you are. If not, we have this online. You can listen to it again later. <laughs> Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God begins to separate light from darkness, water from land, and he gets to have this beautiful picture of how he brings forth his creation, and he fills the seas, and he fills the land, and he fills the air, and then he creates humanity to dwell in this place called Eden, in this garden scene. And so God has created the heavens and the earth and all of his creation, and he puts humanity in it. Verse 26, God said, let us make man, humanity, in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock of all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. He said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So he's given them work to do in this garden. Verse 31, this is the end of day six. God saw that he had made, what he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning on the sixth day. Chapter two opens up, thus the heavens... And the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. And so when, you, when you're in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, It's a picture of how God created the heavens and the earth, and they were joined together. That God's domain was joined with earth's domain, and humanity was joined with God, and God rested in what he called his good creation. Rested could be that he filled it with himself. And there we see in Genesis, God with humanity, unfrustrated and broken by sin, in his good creation. We see that God walked with humanity in the cool of the day, that they enjoyed fellowship with one another. And so Eden becomes the very first temple scene. There's not a temple in Eden because all of Eden is the temple. Temple is where man meets with God, where heaven and earth come together. And that was all of creation in the very beginning. 
And so God had created all of this. And then you see that there's a wedding here. We see that in chapter 2, verse 24, therefore man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. This creation narrative includes a wedding story of man and woman coming together, that it's God's gift to humanity. And then we get to Genesis 3, in which we know this serpent enters the story to deceive Adam and Eve, not to trust in God, not to listen to God's voice, but to listen to his, to rebel against God and to find what is good and right and pleasing for themselves. And they do. And then the earth and creation, their relationships are all cursed. The relationship with God is broken and fractured. And at the end of chapter 3, starting in verse 22, we see this. They are exited from God's good creation. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. And we'll see that his heart will always be bent on evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever with that heart condition. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man, and in the east of the Garden of Eden he placed the cherubim, an angelic warrior, and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And so Genesis 3 ends with humanity outside of heavens and earths that are good and right and pleasing. And the entrance to this temple is guarded now so that humanity may not enter into it and take from the tree of life and live forever in their now corrupted state. And so then you have the story of God and how he will redeem the very beginning, how he will redeem the project that he began with humanity, for he will not give up on his good creation. And so then you have the story of Abraham and Israel gathering to be the people of God around the law of God, the practices and habits and ways of God. And we see in the Psalms the music they put in which their heart cries out for God to restore all of these things, to bring back heaven and earth the relationship of God with man in the cool of the day with the tree of life in its place. And we see the prophets begin to speak about what God will do in sending an anointed one to redeem all of this. And so you have the prophets that we've been looking at. In the book of Revelation, we, we see in Isaiah chapter 25, a passage we've been to several times talking about a wedding feast that will come with God and his people, his bride. Verse 8, he says, He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people will be taken away from all the earth, and the Lord has spoken. This is the hope that God has promised that one day he will defeat death, the very thing that came into his good creation in Genesis and restore all that has been bent and broken and all of the wounds and hardships and abuses that we have experienced, he will wipe those tears away and make all things new. At the end of Isaiah, this is Isaiah chapter 65, he promises that there would actually be a new heaven, a new earth. Verse 17 of 65, God says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. He says, be glad and rejoice, for in that which I create, for behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and for her people to be a gladness. So new heavens, a new earth, a new Jerusalem will come. This is the hope of a nation, of a people, longing for God to restore what has been lost on the very opening pages of the scriptures. The prophet Ezekiel that we have been in through this whole series speaks about a day that is coming that he will restore a temple, a place in which God and humanity will dwell. But this temple, 
that Ezekiel describes from chapter 40 to 48 is the most unusual temple. It's like it can't be built by human hands. In fact, it has a river of life flowing from it to the seas in which gives life everywhere. Ezekiel 47, 1, Then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and behold, water was issuing from below the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the temple faced east. The water was flowing down from below the south end of the threshold of the temple, south of the altar, going out to the seas. Verse 12, And on the banks of this river flowing from the temple, on both sides of the river, there will flow, or sorry, there will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail, but they will bear fresh fruit every month because the water for them flows from the sanctuary. Their fruit will be for food and their leaves for the healing of nations. Like this temple that God will set up will have a river in which life blossoms from and the trees on its bank produce fruit that people will be nourished by and the leaves bring healing to all their wounds. This is a picture that Ezekiel has of what God will ultimately do to restore what has been lost from the very first pages of the Bible. And so when Jesus arrives, this is the hope of Israel. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us to inaugurate the kingdom, the kingdom that would permeate the earth. And we saw that Jesus Christ did this in his life, death, and resurrection, first by making peace between God and man, first dealing with the sin problem, the beast that lives within each of us. That same sin that separated Adam and Eve from God and his good creation that lives within within us had to be first dealt with. And then another longing went out that he would culminate the project that he began, that he would bring to fulfillment all the things that we have seen the prophets speak about, the things that he promised surely he would fulfill And so we see in Romans chapter 8 that there's an inheritance for us who are in Christ. Chapter 8, verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs. Like something is coming that you are going to inherit. There's a heritage now that you belong to if you are in Christ. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. We're connected with Christ's death, his sufferings, and his resurrection. And not only are we connected to Christ and his reward, but we're connected to all the promises of Abraham. Galatians chapter 3 Verse 29, and if you are Christ's, like if you say yes to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So if you're in Christ, you're also an heir of Abraham. You belong to the promises of Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons, and I am one of them, and so are you if you are in Christ. So we inherit the promises of Christ and the promises of Abraham. What what is this inheritance? Well, it's a work that God is doing to restore all things. It's not just to save you and get you out of here. It's to redeem all things that have been broken. So back to Romans 8. Paul says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed to us at Christ's coming. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. 
in the redemption that Christ purchased for the children to be brought into the family of God in the promises of Abraham, creation itself longs for the sons and daughters of God to be fully revealed that they would be set free from bondage and decay. You look around the world and you see the decay and disease and disasters. It's like the trees itself, the ground itself is longing for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed, for Christ to come so that the world itself would be set free. So that what was lost on the very first pages of the Bible would be recovered. God with his people forever. And he wants his people to have in their mind that he has a specific kind of relationship with them forever. It's not a master, subject, domineering relationship. It's not one of a CEO in which abuses his employees for his benefit. It's that of a groom and a bride. And so you open up Ephesians, which is a very practical text on, on just marriage, men and women, how we get along in this covenant of marriage. And, and Paul says, that is a picture of a relationship that God has with the church Ephesians chapter 5, verse 30, 31 says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. There's that Genesis story again. But that Genesis story that many people in this room live in, man and woman married, is pointing to a greater story. Verse 32, this mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This mystery is profound that marriage between a man and a woman of one covenant people is actually speaking to something that God's going to do, that Christ will wed his people forever. When God thinks of a relationship with you in eternity, he thinks of it as a bride and a groom in its intimacy to love you, cherish you, reveal to you the splendors of Christ forevermore. He has an eternal reservoir of blessings that he has to sustain you for an eternity that you might see them. That's the relationship he has envisioned for us. And so here's a recap. Just, these are quick highlights. From the very first pages is God creates humanity to place them in his good garden in which heaven and earth are unified in a temple scene of the whole earth in which there's a wedding there to point to something that's greater, God with his people forever. And then you have a people, Israel. You have a city, Jerusalem, that have a temple longing for it to be restored. God cr crying out to God, when will you come? Wipe our tears, make all things new. And we've been in the book of Revelation of how he answers this prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How will that happen? Revelation is the unfolding of that. And here in chapter 21 now, with all of that in your head, are you ready? John says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Oh, man, this is Isaiah. This is what God promised to Isaiah. It's happening. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Now, in the book of Revelation, the sea has, has been the place of evil, has been the place in which the beast itself was animated from. I love what Fenning says. I just printed it out. This certainly signals the end of the sea as the source of evil in God's world. The potential of the new creation reverting to evil and incurring judgment as the old once did is now completely removed. And so when John says I, there's no sea, it's like the source of evil that we've seen in Revelation is completely removed from the heavens and the earth. There's no chance for evil to rear its head again. Verse 2, and I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem. 
It's like God's doing it, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. There's the bridal language. That this city, this new Jerusalem, is actually a people. It's a people and a place coming from heaven to earth. This final scene is not us going somewhere. It's God preparing a place for us, coming again. And it's the new heavens, the new earth, a new wedding, a new Jerusalem. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. Here it is, Eden, God with his people, walking with them in the cool of the day. And this will never end. And look what he does. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. I love that. Here's the new heavens, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the new wedding of God with his people. And this is how he relates to us. This is how close he is to you is he has the tenderness to be close enough to put his thumb on your cheek and wipe away tears. That's the eternal relationship with the creator God that John is seeing. Verse 5, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. It doesn't say he's making all new things, does it? He says, I'm making all things new. I'm restoring what has been broken. Now, there's a marvelous mystery here of how all things new are also no eye has seen nor ear imagined the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And yet there's continuity with the world in which he has restored. Jesus' resurrection is the picture of this. Resurrected bodily, visibly, that his body is somewhat the same, that there's, there, they can recognize him at times, and yet it is fundamentally different. It's transformed. And there's something about Jesus' own resurrection that gives us a clue of what he's going to do in making all things new. Let me ask you this. Do you really long for all new things? Or does your heart really long for all things that have been broken, distorted, bent, and bruised to be fully renewed? And renewed in such a way that there's continuity, but there's actually transformation. It's unbelievably new. You you almost don't recognize it. That's what God is doing, is all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for those words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. It's finished. Those, Those are the words like on the cross, the sacrificial death of Christ for the forgiveness of sins was finished, and now the redemption of all things, it is done. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. There's nothing outside Jesus. Nothing was before him. Nothing will be after him. And he says this, to the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. How many of you have ever been thirsty in your life? How many of you have been thirsty and you had to buy like a $5 thing of water in the airport? (laughs) Yeah. Here Jesus says, the only prerequisite of you coming to me is that you're thirsty. You don't even have to come with money. You show up with thirst. He doesn't even say eat. Like eating would take effort. You have to choose something. Like thirsty, all you got to do is show up and drink what the Lord has prepared for you. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. You don't show up with anything in your pockets. Just a thirst. And he will satisfy. The one who conquers will have this heritage. In other words, inheritance. Will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my son. So now you have, a, you have a renewed marriage, and now you have a renewed family, a family dynamic in which God relates to us as father and son. 
not as our earthly fathers, but as a heavenly father who is perfect. And he has an inheritance for us in his son, Jesus Christ. And this harkens us back to the very opening pages of Revelation, to the church that was compromised on their witness. They had compromised in many ways. And they were called out of that to say, be more than a conqueror. Overcome the ways in which you have compromised in witnessing for me. And this will be your heritage, your reward. Verse 8, though, there is a stark warning. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. It's just a reminder that this, in order for God to recreate all things new in which evil and sin have no opportunity to distort again, he will fully remove that out of his good creation. And anyone who is bent on doing those things will be removed so that his good creation will not be thwarted again. Now, this is what I find so starking. In, or startling, in this list here, they're essentially liars, murderers, sexually immoral, immoral, like witchcraft, all this stuff. You're like, yeah, that makes sense. But do you see how it started? As for the cowardly, there's no room in God's eternal kingdom for the cowardly. I don't know if that disturbs you like it disturbs me. But I think this is a call for the church back in chapters 2 and 3 to wake up and say, I have called you to be overcomers, and it will take courage to do it. It will take courage to be filled with grace for those that you do not want to extend it to. And it will take courage to stand up for the truth in which you'd rather not share with people. But the cowardly are not welcomed in the kingdom. And I think for me, it's like, man, that's why I need Jesus. I'm, I'm all these things apart from Jesus. That's why his grace is so good, is that he satisfies everything in which I have failed. Then verse 9 then came one of the seven angels who had seven bowls full of seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So this has been a, a habit of revelation, which is to go back again. By going back, it also moves forward. So we saw the bride in chapter 19. We saw the bride in the beginning of chapter 21. Again, he's going to show you the bride. So then I saw it's not always sequential. Let me show you the bride. Let me show you the bride. And again, let me show you the bride. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Remember, who's the bride? The church. You're the bride. Let me show you what you look like. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain. If you've ever been in your Bible, you know holy things happen on mountains. And he showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. This isn't a city that people rebuilt. This is a city that God has prepared from heaven out of heaven, from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like the most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with the 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and on the gates, the names of the 12 tribes of the Son of Israel were inscribed, just like Ezekiel had said. And so these walls and these gates are set up of this city. It's fortified by these angels, but none of the gates are closed. They're always open, which is an indication that this kingdom is always at peace. It never has to close the gates because it's never threatened by evil. It's a place of life. And so you have the 12 tribes, Israel, inscribed on this new Jerusalem, but not just that. It says, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. This is the disciples. And so this, this new Jerusalem is both the fulfillment of Israel and the fulfillment to the apostles. It's one new community in Christ. 
is both covenants of old and new in eternity. In verse 15, and the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. It says the city lies four square, its length the same as its width. So that means it's, it's the same long as it is wide as it is going to be high. There's one other thing in the Bible that's described that way. Do you know what it is? It's the holy of holies in the temple. The holiest place in which God dwelt. But the Holy of Holies in the temple was a place that was reserved for the high priest to go one time a year. But that Holy of Holies has become the entire city. God with his people in the most holy, intimate relationship you can imagine, not restricted, fully open. And so he measures this out. The city is rod. 12,000 stadia, it says. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured the wall, 144 cubits by human measurements, which is also an angel's measurement, if you wanted to know that. <laughs> the wall was built, and it just describes the beauty of this. Remember, it's always in contrast. This bride is in contrast to the harlot of Babylon, who was destroyed. And here this bride is loved and preserved. It says, The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. And it lists all of these beautiful jewels, mentioning even the gates are, are like one large pearl. This is to show the beauty of this place. These jewels were, descri were descriptions of Eden itself in Ezekiel. These jewels were also to be worn by the high priests, it's like, we are priests in this city. These jewels were also described in the book of Revelation as the throne room of God. It's all bringing, coming together as one place, God with man, in this beautiful picture. Verse 22, we'll pick up here. And I saw no temple in the city. Why don't you need a temple? The whole purpose of a temple is to join heaven and earth so that God can meet with man. Well, God is dwelling with man. There's no need of a temple. It says, and I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God and the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city had no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. By its light will the nations walk, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. They will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. It's a fully diverse of people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language are here. But nothing unclean will ever enter it, nor anyone who does what is detestable or false, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Here's that book of life mentioned again. We saw it last week. And the closest parallel is the, is, a, is the registration of citizenry. Those who were citizens of certain cities in Rome would have a book in which their name was written in. It's like the old yellow pages. It's like, you can actually look someone's number up. They live here. But the, the Lamb's book of life, all the names in there are the names that, that Jesus has inscribed. They belong to me. These are the list of my children. These are citizens of the city that I have made and prepared. They have a dwelling place in my city. Their names are individual and put here. Verse 1 of chapter 22. Then the angel showed me the river of water of life. Here it is from the temple of Ezekiel. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. And night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. There's no instrument of illumination. God himself is the light of this city forever. 
So do you see what's happened? On the last pages of this Bible, 66 books, 40 authors telling the story of God to redeem all things, to recover what has been lost from the very first pages. The first pages of God creating heavens and earth and dwelling with man in his good creation and the tree of life by its rivers is now fully restored in new heavens and new earth, God dwelling with humanity. And there's the tree of life in this city bearing fruit every single month and in its leaves the healing to the nations. The world has been completely healed. And so what you see at the end of Revelation is not that we have left this place and gone to some distant galaxy, not that you got your own planet. Know that God has restored everything that he has made and he has brought you in, not as a subject, not merely as a servant, but as a bride that he can love forever. That is a Christian picture of what it looks like at the end of, of history. And so there's all these other ideas of human history of how this whole thing's going to end, and they're rather violent, they're chaotic, and you have to go back to your scriptures and say, it looks like actually God restores all things. And for those who love him, he welcomes them into his eternal kingdom as brides. And they'll be in a forever love relationship with their creator, God with man. And so at Christmas time, we sing these songs about Emmanuel, God with us. But Jesus with us was just simply a foretaste of what will be in the new heavens and the new earth when he restores all of this. Emmanuel, come. We're going to sing that Christmas carol, and I want Revelation 21 in your mind when you sing. And so I'm going to have the team come back up. Let's just pray, and let's ask God that he would give us minds to see what he is going to do to restore all things. And so, Father, we thank you for a revelation, a revealing of things that we would not otherwise have known of what you are ultimately going to do with your creation that we have distorted, misused, bent, and broken. And so, Lord, our ultimate hope, again, is in your coming. And so, Lord, come. Oh, come and be Emmanuel, God with us in new heavens and new earth, in a new city, a new place, as a new people where every tear is wiped and every wound is mended and we are loved. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.